Tonight I want to talk to you about the true disciple. The true disciple. Luke chapter 14, and we'll start in verse 25. And the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. I didn't know if you knew that. Uh, but the word disciple is used 264 times in the New Testament. And some people kind of try to figure out the difference between the two. And, uh, you know, we, we look at the 12 disciples, uh, but they we're, we're not talking about apostles. That's a different thing. But I truly believe listening to Jesus, if you'll look through the Gospels, uh, you'll see the word disciple, and he's not just talking about his 12 disciples. I believe he's talking about all Christians, okay? And uh, this particular scripture that we uh, are, are talking about uh, is uh, one of my favorite scriptures, and you have to realize it happened not too long after he fed 5,000. In, in chapter 9, uh, I believe it was, where he fed 5,000, and there were still uh, multitudes following him. But after this particular uh, sermon, I believe, and, and you can see here, up to his crucifixion, and I've said this many times, folks, the closer he got to the cross, the fewer that followed him. Okay? Because uh, even the disciples, uh, we shared this uh, on Sunday night, you know, they, they even thought, you know, this is a hard saying. This is, we don't even understand what you're saying. Uh, but uh, the word disciple, and, and again, the simplest form of disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay, the, the simplest definitions. There's all kinds of definitions, but the simplest one is a follower of Jesus Christ. If you look at your outline, uh, the true disciple, number one, surrenders everything to Jesus. Okay, and, and I do believe this, this happens and should happen at the point of salvation. Surrenders everything to Jesus. Number two, counts the cost. Counts the cost. Being a disciple will cost you something, I promise you. All right, because I still go back to what I said either this past Sunday or before. Anybody can call them a, you're themselves a Christian. Okay, there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm a Christian. You know, but I'm just saying a disciple to me is a follower. It's, it's a deeper walk with God, okay? And, and with, in our, our deal here is with Jesus. The third thing, a uh, true disciple forsakes all that he has. Forsakes all that he has. Let's look in Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Now, great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. And I'm sure there was some shock on people's faces uh, with what he said. I'm sure some people was, you know, wondering because I still think with the large here, the large multitude. I think many of them was following him uh, for what he could do for them. I mentioned the feeding of the 5,000s or to see if he was going to do another miracle. So there was still a crowd here. And, and I believe when he made this statement here, and I don't think he was trying to shock anybody with it. I think he was just simply preparing them and saying, this is what being a disciple is. And when you use the word hate, okay, I don't think, I really don't think he meant what our definition of hate is. Hate is despise. Okay, when you think of hate in a normal use in our uh, vocabulary, you think hate, I, you know, like I have taught my kids and I've taught my grandkids not to say I hate you or I hate someone. Okay, because I do not believe hate should be in the heart of a disciple, or as far as that goes, a Christian. And now, the obsession, we can hate Satan, we can hate sin. Okay, but I do not believe that's what Jesus was saying. I believe what he was saying was, 
For instance, I love my, my mom and my dad had passed. I love my sisters. I love my wife. I love my children. I really love my grandchildren. <laughs> All right. I mean, I love all my children. And I'm just saying there's something special about grandchildren. Me and Kylie were playing hide and seek when I got home today. So that was the coolest thing. All right. Because she don't like to hide by herself. And I said, you have to hide. Anyway, I just trying to, trying to get you to understand. <laughs> it's a different deal. What he was truly saying was that you love me, okay, more than these, all right? And, and again, folks, we're talking about discipleship. We're talking about surrender. We're talking about, you know, it's, it's no, we can, we can still love. And, and you say, what are you basing that on? How about the first commandment? Okay, thou shalt have no other gods before us. Sometimes, folks, you know, our families can be our gods. Our children can be our gods. Okay, and I'm all for supporting them. I will always be there with them. But, you know, God needs to be first in our lives. That's what he's saying. Okay, I don't, you're not supposed to hate your family. It's just that God, God and Jesus are the most important thing in your life. And you can ask Lori, uh, folks, it took her a while to get used to being a staff wife, okay? And I'll be honest with you, with staff wives, there's two things. Number one, they get cheated because the, our attention, and I'm just confessing that I probably don't pay enough attention to staff wife, not staff wives, my wife, okay? I about got myself in trouble there. But the other thing is they're always, and Cindy, you can attest to this, they're always waiting on us to get home. You don't know when we're going to get home. You don't know how we're going to be when we get home. You don't know what we've done. You know, do that. But I love Lori with all my, I would die for my wife. I would die for my children. I would die for my grandchildren. But I'm telling you, we need to put God first. A true disciple, it, it appears, it, it is that we're so sold out that we understand that God is, is first in our lives. Mark chapter 8, go with me there. You can see it on your handout there, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And again, Jesus uh, is getting towards the end of his ministry in Mark chapter 8. And it says, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, notice it wasn't just his disciples. There were just people with him, all right? Because we still say that, and, and sometimes even, you know, it's like soul winning. Well, that's your job, preachers. No, the Bible says it's everybody's job, okay? We all need to be soul winners, all right? We all need to be disciples. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Folks, that's the key to being a disciple, okay? Dying to self. We talked about that this past Sunday. And take up his cross and follow me. And again, he's going to talk about a cross in a minute in the other scripture, so I'm going to wait and explain what he means there, in my opinion. For, and notice the word there, follow me. Hey, when he called his disciples, what did he say to every one of them? What did he say to Peter? Put down your nets and what? Follow me. Okay? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does that mean? Sold out. The real deal. Okay? A disciple, a Christian. All right? And it says, Or what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And again, the loses his life is simply saying, All right, my life is God's. Okay? I had turned everything over to God. I have sold out. And, and again, I'm not talking finances here, but God, God does have my finances. God does have my family. God does have my home and, and my truck. And God does, uh, you know, I, I try to honor him in my job. I try to, uh, you know, tell people about, because he, he said, and the gospel sakes. And folks, that's, that's really, I mean, the reason, because even a couple of people talked to me you know, you said you're going to Revelation, I, and, and what I said was, if the Lord lets me go. And when we were in Acts, I knew the next thing was, was uh, Romans. 
And folks, you cannot separate those two, all right? Because the gospel started in Acts, and it goes all the way through the book of Romans. So if we are going to be a true disciple, folks, we've got to sell out. We've got to sell out everything. What I call total surrender. And, and the other thing, and I know you know this scripture. Some of you can quote the scripture, but I want you to see it anyway. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22, verse 35. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Now, I think it's interesting that it was a lawyer, by the way. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord our, your God with, now notice three times, all, all, and all. What is that? Folks, that's everything. Okay. And Again, we can say I love God, we can say I love you, but when it comes, I mean, can we honestly say I've given everything to God? Everything. Worry, anxiety, think about it, folks. All to God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Folks, that's your total being. That's everything you are, everything that you uh, think, everything that you I uh, want to be everything, you know, I mean, when you go to bed, you're thinking about God. When you get up, you're thinking about God, okay? You know, he's just on your mind all the time. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And again, I think the deal about neighbor, I'll just tell you what I think. It's a reference, to, again, to the gospel the gospel. And folks, we, we share the gospel at times, but to me, the first place we ought to start with the gospel is with our family, and the second place we ought to start the gospel with our neighbors. Why? Because they see you. They see you leave for church every Sunday morning. They know when you're not there. They know what you do. They know what you're about. You know, they see uh, you put Jesus is the reason for the season in your yard. Okay? And so, uh, I, I would just hate to think, I think, you know, it'd be so hard to get to heaven, you know, and, and again, again, I know the song, thank you and all that, but, but to realize maybe that somebody wasn't there, you know, that was a neighbor, and yet, you know, I never shared the gospel with them. Okay, so again, surrendering everything. Uh, let me throw something in here, and we're talking about, or I'm talking about the gospel. We have to s surrender our fears. Okay, because the greatest fear, I'm just telling you, the greatest fear some people have is to witness somebody. It's a huge fear. And folks, you have to surrender everything to God. All right, let's keep going here. Back in Luke 14, and it says in verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come, come after me cannot uh, be my disciples. It's obvious that we don't have literal crosses to bear but it's obvious that jesus had to bear his cross and he bared his cross for us and what i think he's talking about and when i think of suffering all right a, a cross in those days was an interest uh, instrument of death so we go back have to die to self and also a cross was a was a thing of suffering i think as christians also we have to, if we're going to be a disciple, we're going to suffer, okay? It's not always going to be, you know, this thing of, you know, you get saved and everything's cool. You get saved and you don't have a problem in the world. You get saved, you know, all things fall into place. Folks, I'm still saying they're suffering in true Christianity. Persecution is a form. And the reason we don't think about persecution is because we are not really persecuted in America. There are people that lose their lives. But really, what the third thing I want to say about that is I think our cross is doing the hard things, going that extra mile, okay? Not just coming to church on Sunday morning, okay? It's, it's, it's coming Sunday night, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> you are here on Wednesday night, but you are going the extra mile, and I commend you for that. I'm not judging the other folks. I'm simply sharing with you what the Word of God says. 
Jesus had a cross. And you think about it, folks. I believe with all my heart, when he was born, he lived in the shadow of that cross. He took, every step he took was towards Calvary. Everything he did was towards Calvary. And folks, that's the kind of, and I know you have to have jobs, and I know you have to have time for your family. I know you have, and the key to all that, let me just quickly say, it's balance. It's trying to keep balance in our life. But we do have crosses to bear. So the second thing is count the cost. Verse 28, for you who intend building a tower and does not sit down and first count the cost. There's the word. Uh, it's easy to get an outline when you take it right out of your scripture, okay? Really easy. Uh, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin and start to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. And again, we wouldn't do that with a house. I wouldn't go to Paul Walker and say, I want a house. How big do you want it? Okay, here's how, here's how big I want it. What do you want on the inside? It don't matter. Okay, you, you just put whatever you want on the inside. Wherever you want the kitchen, uh, you know, and I'll tell you one thing, my wife would never go for that. All right? And, and I wouldn't even ask him. Paul would ask me, do you care what it costs? No, no, no. Just, I, I need a 2,000 foot house. Paul would look at me like, you're nuts. Preacher, you've gone crazy. Why? Because you want to know. You want to know where things are at. You want to know what they cost. Uh, in Lot, long, long time ago, some guy was advertising a new water park. And not a water park. It, it wasn't even a park. It was a slide. And on uh, West Lee Boulevard, they started that. And he got about halfway down, or maybe even three-fourths of the way down, and it just stopped. And so I, I go by that going to one of the hospitals there, and for months, nothing was done. And for years, nothing was done and nothing was done. And I'm, I'm thinking, what happened? Well, obviously, the guy did not find out how much it cost or what was going to happen there. And that was a testimony to, I mean, I didn't know the guy's name. All I knew it was, I know I would have liked that. I was, I was still, I was a youth minister. You don't think we would have been at that water slide? But he didn't count the cost. And folks, we have to count the cost. Look at verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Again, I understand God. I understand the story of Gideon. I understand, you know, with God, all things are possible. All right? But still, I mean, you need to know what you are, you know, first who you are fighting and how many people you are fighting. So in life, we count the cost. So obviously, Jesus was giving them an illustration of you need to count the cost. Folks, I am telling you, living a, a, a disciple's life will cost you something. Okay, it will cost you something. I, I'm not necessarily talking about money, okay? Because again, I feel like tithing is one, I mean, to me, it's one of the easiest things to do as, as a disciple or even a Christian, folks. It, it really is. But he's talking about in our lives, we need to, uh, you know, uh, count the cost. Luke chapter 18. Just go over a couple of chapters here. Luke 18. Verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, good teacher. Have you noticed how they like to call him teacher? Uh, what, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said in him, why do you call me good? Well, folks, good, uh, there's, there's a lot of definitions for good, by the way. No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Okay? Five of them. Okay, he, J Jesus threw five of the commandments out. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. And you know what I say? Seriously? You've never lied? Okay. So I think the rich young ruler was in ways even fooling himself. Okay. Because I'm saying if you are an adult and you went all through your childhood, you went all through your teenage years, and you went all the way through your young adults and never lied, I question the person that says that. Now, Jesus did. But I'm telling you, this guy wasn't Jesus. 
Then in verse 21, he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. All right? And, and folks, Jesus had him. I mean, he had him. I mean, to me, bear false witness, he already had him. But that's the thing about Jesus. He knows us all individually. He knows where our weaknesses are. He knows where there are things that we haven't surrendered to him. He knew who this guy was. He knew what we was about. He knew what we see he was thinking. He knew that he was testing him, thinking he was going to somehow, you know, fool Jesus. You still lack one thing, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. There's that word again. Come and follow me. What was this guy's problem? He was rich. He had a lot of money. That's why, folks, it's hard. I mean, even later on, it said it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 23. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And again, folks, um, I, I don't know. You know, even when I came here, uh, we were $770,000 in debt for the gym. Uh, when we s started talking about building this, you know, they were just thinking, man, that's, I, I had told me several people, preacher, that's a lot of money. Uh, folks, God owns everything. God owns everything. We need to depend on God for everything. I know, and I even, I even believe in finances. Folks, I, I just believe you know, I, I as a preacher, you notice I don't preach on money. Very, I mean, I try to do it once a year. But my whole thing, and this proves true to what my whole deal was. When I came here, I told the finance committee, all right, I'm not going to badger people about giving. If you will get people in love with Jesus, they will give to the causes of Jesus. And I'm telling you, God, for 18 years, it's, it's amazing what we have done. Just in, in the last, we, we, get, we got down to $1.5 billion. So we've, in four years, a little over four years, four and a half years, paid half of our uh, $3.5 million debt. Why? Because we got people here that's in love with Jesus. So surrender everything. Count the cost. And number three, forsakes all that he has. Forsakes all that he has. Look back in our scripture. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Folks, I, I don't know how plainer Jesus could get. Okay? And I believe it was Billy Graham, uh, you know, uh, one of his quotes, uh, he was talking about lost church members and I don't know the exact, uh, I think I know, and, and I'll just say, I know this was in the, the ballpark of what he said. He said probably 60 to 65% of people that attend church are not born again Christians. And I, I'm telling you, I, I had to look hard, I had to listen hard about that. But then when I started, not just, I mean, you know, this this certain, not just today, okay, and, and I'm not disagreeing or agree. I'm just saying I don't know, that's the, the, the neat thing about being a pastor, I, I don't know who's saving who isn't. I think, you know, I think it's probably lower than that, just again, my personal opinion, but still if it's 50%, uh, you know, it, it, it hurts me, it hurts me uh, because of this first. So likewise, Whoever you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And again, uh, folks, uh, the word committed is something uh, that we need to have in our life uh, as disciples. The word dedicated is something that we need to have in our life as disciple. The word love needs to be in our vocabulary. Uh, and we, we really do. We we base you know who we are on loving god and loving people all right it's even part of of our theme and who who we are and folks you notice the first love is is loving god 
And the, the next thing I want to throw in with loving God is loving God unconditionally. And you say, well, why? I can tell you why. Because that's the love He has for us. He has shown us unconditional love, so we need to show others that kind of love. Acts chapter 4. Go with me to Acts chapter 4. I love this. And, you know, Peter and John was arrested, and basically the Sanhedrin was getting all over them, and they're just saying, man, you need to stop this preaching. Uh, Y'all are causing an uprising here. This is just not right. Uh, you know, and two times they had got on them. And I love verse 13. And, and I really, I really strive to live my life so in love with Jesus that this would apply to my personal life. Verse 13. For when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. All right, they marveled. They just thought, because they knew who they were. We're talking about fishermen, folks. All right, we're not talking about well educated, trained in Jewish theology. We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about Jesus took fishermen, a tax collector. Just think of, you know, the ones that he called. And the people marveled at the way they spoke. In, in what they did. And they had realized that they had been with Jesus. And again, you have to understand, the whole deal was, you know, Peter was at the temple gate and blind men sitting there. Everybody in the world saw, you know, who he was and what happened. And he basically said, in the name of Jesus. Oh, no, that was the rise up and rock. I'm on the wrong one there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but it still works. All right. They knew he had been with Jesus. One more verse. Romans chapter 1, and also you know this one. In talking about being a disciple, talking about witnessing, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and for also the Greek. Folks, we should not be ashamed of being a disciple of Christ. If somebody calls me a Christian, I, I think that's great. If somebody calls me a disciple of Christ, I think that's even better. But the key there, for it is the power of God. Okay? It's that Holy Spirit, that dunamis that is in us that allows us to be a disciple for Christ. And not only the Holy Spirit in us, it's the Holy Spirit using us when we witness to tell other people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, I know it's not on your notes, but just says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Folks, it all comes down. When it comes to being a disciple, it's just trusting God and having faith in God and realizing, you know what? Nothing happens in my life by accident. Uh, God, everything that happens is for a reason and a purpose. And no matter what happens, I'm going to keep trusting and I'm going to put my faith in Christ. Father, thank you for this night. And God, I do thank you for this Bible study time. And God, I, I, I do. I, I, you know, I understand Christians and I love Christians. I'm not trying to separate that. Uh, but God, it was so obvious. Uh, you were speaking to disciples and we all need to be not just Christians, but disciples. God, we need to be sold out. Uh, we need to surrender everything. Uh, we need to uh, fall, not just fall in love with Jesus, but to fall deeply in love with Jesus. God, we need to count the cost. And uh, Lord, when I think of what it costs for my salvation, it costs the life of your only son. And God, I can never repay. I can never do enough, be enough, uh, witness enough. Lord, I can't pay that kind of cost because we're going to get to live with you forever and ever. So God, I pray that you would help us to make our lives count right here on earth. Well, that's one thing we can do. We can take 
people to heaven with us. And God, I pray that we as disciples would do our best to do that. And God, again, I, I, I just pray that we wouldn't hold anything back, Lord. I just pray that uh, when, and, and even, Lord, I hadn't even thought of really about my tombstone, uh, but I, I just, you know, when I get to heaven, I, I want to hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, but uh, I, I would love something like, uh, he forsake all. He, he gave his all for his Lord and Savior. And God, I just pray that, uh, Lord, you would just be foremost in our minds. Oh, Lord, that we would wake up thinking about you, reading your word, praying to you, uh, that uh, whoever we're around, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's at a ball game, uh, Lord, at a gas station, at a grocery store, uh, that they could tell that we are disciples of you. So God, again, uh, thank you uh, for our Bible study tonight and just uh, bless us, Lord, this night. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.